and welcome. Good to be with you, Marla. So, Ken's book, Courageous uh, Aging, I, you know, I was, this book is so poignant, and, and we were talking about, you know, how, how at this age now, I'm over 50, and everybody, everybody's getting older, and our, our society is really anti-aging, anti-death, um, we're all going to die, so I tend to kind of make it fun, I'm wearing, I don't know if you can see my shirt, but I'm wearing a, a skull, I don't think you can see it, but I'll stand up. It's a skull love with it. roses on it. Love it. <laughs> I love, love it. my husband's from Mexico, so they do Day of the Dead, and I have a lot of skulls, and I have some friends who are like, ooh, that's so morbid, and I'm like, well, I think it's kind of cool. And um, actually, you know, uh, you talk about how we've sanitized death, and I'm doing a, I volunteer for hospice, so I'm do, doing at my house next week a death cafe. Have you heard yes. of those? Tell me about it. Well, a death cafe, I think it came over from England, and you get together, and you have, they say on the website, you have cake. Well, we have a potluck and wine or whatever, and we get together and talk about death in a fun way or reminisce about our relatives or this or that, and uh, it's going to be a Halloween theme, and so I think it's going to be great because this is what we're all, you know, facing. You know, it, it, it's remarkable. Some of us don't get to face it. If we're lucky... We get to get older mm -hmm. and we get to face in. And it's part of our responsibility to face into every chat, every challenge, every chapter of life. And in this chapter, we get to kind of look at the watch and go, hmm, I'm not going to be here forever. So what do I want to do about that? And we get to make choices and make create priorities. But we also get the choice of whether we're going to face into mm -hmm. things right. like death, yeah. or whether we're going to face into the kind of things that are changing. We look in the mirror and we go, my God, look at where, where did that come from? You know, and or we look in the store window and we notice that we look a little older. That's it's, right. The, you have it. You have chapter one. It says, I often it's an unexpected glimpse of your own reflection that does it suddenly it hits you I'm getting old you think just look at me I'm not the same person I used to be I used to you know be the one where heads would turn when I walked in a room I'd get a lot of compliments I was always very pretty and now it's like I, I glance at myself in the mirror and it's like whoa you know <laughs> it's like, but, I, I avoid that now right it's it is interesting how we see that that now. is the moment of truth that is a beautiful example okay and we, you know, guys, as guys, we become the silver fox. It's like, oh, I'm you know, getting a little silver. Gee, that's sexy, you know. And it's so different in so many ways for men and women. It's yeah. also the same in some ways. But, you know, my God, the curse of being a beautiful woman mm -hmm. and then having to compare, if you choose, yourself to the 20-year-old version of yourself, the 25-year-old that turn heads because we're in a culture that says that's your true and real value. How do I begin to embrace so that I'm not in this critical conversation with that admonishing, look at you, you know, I'm not in an adversarial conversation, a critical conversation. How do I change the conversation so that when I look in the mirror, I'm embracing this person that I am today, that I am now. I'm loving her. I'm holding her in loving arms. I'm telling her, you look beautiful. Look at you, you know, and you don't need to be, you don't need to be 35 to look beautiful. And, you know, look at that, look at the way you are now and let's embrace it because that's the way of life. Well, okay, this is interesting. So things changed for me probably around 42. So like I said, I was always the one getting a lot of attention. If I'd go out, men would approach this and that. I remember going to a, I worked at this matchmaking company in Beverly Hills, and I, there was a beautiful, uh, my assistant matchmaker, she was 25, gorgeous. She had modeled, blonde, tall, thin, you know, our standard of beauty, like a Heidi Klum. And she, we went out to a, a, a restaurant. We were going to be recruiting some women and socializing, so we walked together. I looked real great you know I always kept my figure and I had my dress on and stuff we walked in together I was it's like I wasn't even alive yeah, every guy looked at her they were talking to her hi hi and it was the first time I'd experienced that and then we went to eat uh, at a Mexican restaurant we sat at the bar and the Mex and I speak Spanish my husband's from Mexico and I talked to one of the bus boys he brought some chips and we're sitting there and he says to me in Spanish oh is she your daughter 
And I was just like, that was the, fr- I, I was like, what? No, I, I'm not old enough to have children. I don't have children. I'm not a mother. You know, it was like so devastating. That whole trip is like, okay, that's it. And then, um, <laughs> so it was- change in status. It's that yes. first time. It's that first time that whether it's you're a guy or, or a woman, it's that something happens and it lets you know, it smacks you in the face. I am not that person. Yeah. And I've got to say, you know what? It's okay to grieve mm-hmm. the that the loss of that younger version of myself mm-hmm. that had all those wonderful things. Maybe I was even a little arrogant. And, right. You know, right. Or, right. But it's okay to grieve the loss of that and to say, you know what? Damn it. I wish the nature of life was that I could have looked that way forever and I could live forever. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's that moment of truth where we get to change the conversation in our hearts and in our minds to say, you know what, I was blessed to have that season of life. Mm-hmm. What are the blessings in this season of life that if I spend all my time thinking about the past, mm-hmm. grieving in a prolonged way, continuously grieving the loss of that younger self, tell myself that, my best possible future is behind me. Mm-hmm. If I do that, what am I going to miss out on in terms of the blessings of this moment, right. of this moment of life, of looking around me and saying, my life is blessed in all of these ways. I can be so grateful. Look at all the opportunities for me to create my best possible future by living forward. Yeah, well, and then then another thing I had realized was I remember when, so this is like maybe 15 years ago, my husband's an entertainer, so he plays, performs in Beverly Hills live and stuff, so I'd go sit at the piano, and then men would be approaching, or, or anytime guys would keep coming up, and I thought to myself, if I didn't look like this, they wouldn't be talking to me. So it's nothing to do with me, it's just they happen to like this look, so it's not even... even and then I thought, so it really means nothing, and... and uh, then a friend of mine, recently, she's turned 60, and then she says, oh, I was feeling a little down, you know, I can't get this weight off, and I'm looking at the mirror, I look older, so she, I said, well, you know what I've been doing? I said, I've been con- I've been not looking in the mirror, thinking about that, I've been concentrating on all the wonderful things I like to do now, What my blog, my uh, YouTube show, my newsletter, my healing, my get into all the fun stuff and just not looks-based, mm-hmm. get into that. Yeah. And it's and and you're changing the conversation, and you know what? There are people, whether it's men or other women, because women can be so competitive with other women. Yeah. Who is going to miss out on the beauty in me now? Mm-hmm. Who is likely to look right past the richness in my life, to look past all the ways that I've grown my soul, all the all the things that I've learned that I have to share the wealth of me and the worth of me because I don't want to be around people who can't see past, who are looking for some image, some look Mm -hmm. to fall in love with, to connect with, something that promises them perhaps their own eternal youth. But I, I don't want to be with people who can't see past that. I want people who can see me for who I am for how beautiful I am inside and outside, because I may not look like the 25 or 35 year old, but if you look into my eyes, it's interesting, you know, you're bringing this up because I just came from my 50th high school reunion (laughs) and something amazing happened at the reunion. You know, you'd look at some, we all had these little name tags. Matter of fact, I've got, I've got mine here. Okay. So, here we all got to wear these things. Oh, that is so great! Oh. Wear so your high school like, picture. Yeah, that's me. And so that you know, you look at somebody and you go, "Oh yeah, yeah." Oh, it's you. But what happened? What started happening is people started taking their name things off, and we look at each other and go, "Yeah, you know, kind of." Do I know you? Uh-huh. And as soon as somebody would smile. Mm-hmm. As soon as a smile came on their face, you go, oh, it's you. <laughs> now I know who it is. It's the spirit. It was our radiance coming from inside and showing up in our eyes and our smile. 
that helped us identify the part of us that is forever young. Right. That is forever us. That is the essential quality of, of joyfulness or of selflessness or kindness that we remember each other through. And that's what happened at the reunion. Oh, that is so much fun. Well, you were bringing up looking people looking for a perfect look to fall in love with. I'm a matchmaker, right? So 16 years, and and it seems like everyone's Dorian Gray. <laughs> it's like I know I'm 50, but everyone thinks I'm 30, or I know I'm I know I'm 40, but everybody thinks I'm like 27. So ever I've never heard anybody say I look my age, or they all say I look so much younger. Therefore, I should be with a younger partner. So it's all, um, it's very, it's frustrating for me as a matchmaker because men are visual and for, they all want a younger woman. They all want a youthful look. And, and I understand that the mechanisms of getting excited to have sex, you need to like what you see for a man, you know, so I understand it, but it is so tough when a man's looking for someone 30, 20, 30, 40 years, their seat, their junior. And that's you, a, I'm not a magician, right? I say I'm a mere matchmaker. <laughs> Let me tell you what I do with guys for my coaching clients, okay. because many of them have been on the, the dating sites and the matchmaking sites, and they're just not finding what they want. And I will sit down and do an audit. I'll say, all right, I'm going to sit down with you for the next hour and I'm going to go through your choice, choices. I'm going to do an audit on your chooser. Okay. Now, our chooser yeah. is the part of us that looks, that listens, that reads, that configures, okay, I want to meet that person. So, and, and often I've written articles for eHarmony.com and so on. But when I talk about refining your chooser, what am I doing? I'm talking about the guys I, I sit down with and I say, tell me, let's go through each one of these people. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you love. And it's like, well, she's a brunette. I only, I'm really yeah. looking for Blue say, eyes, hold it, hold it. big hey, boobs, whoa, right? Whoa, whoa. <laughs> stop for a minute. Let's read who this person is. Does that resonate with you? Mm -hmm. She just said that she's, you know, she has a couple of children. That's something you said you wanted in your life. Mm -hmm. You just said it's important to you, somebody who's physically active, who loves to hike, yeah. and who loves to travel. Is that important to you? Might you be able to, the way a lot of people find they can, fall in love with somebody on the basis of all of their qualities, all this beautiful combination, this mix, this beautiful recipe of qualities that they possess of beauty they possess inside and out, mm -hmm. might you be attracted and try to meet somebody mm -hmm. and get to know somebody that is outside of the box of your user, your usual chooser requirements, yeah. that fixed image, that look that you're looking for, that you think is going to fulfill the promise, the, un, the unfulfilled promise of, of your need, companionship need. So we do that, and sure enough, really, an amazing amount of success. It's like, we had a great time. This is the kind of person that I would love to spend each day of life with. We're, it was so interesting. We just loved each other's company. But, you know, I, I've never, I was always looking for a blonde. Mm -hmm. I was always looking for a brunette. I was always looking for somebody with a darker complexion. Yeah. And, and this person is everything I've wanted. And... The, the part about blonde and the hair color is has become irrelevant to me. Yeah, well, it's a it's a great point and something that I have that that's the real stickler for us high end matchmakers because the guys will. I'll send them photos and bios and say, this girl's a great fit. She has, you guys have so much in common. Well, but I really like the Latina look, or I really like, or I have to have a C cup chest. I had a guy who needed like the uh, F cup chest. It was the overblown, like porno type of chest only. Oh, and she had to be real thin. They get really specific on, on this look and they won't let that go. So I'm, the, I've had guys turn down 40, 45 women that I've presented that were all lovely and because of their stuck on the look. And I can't seem to, I, I'd well, like to get them hypnotized us, or do you have any pills I can get? <laughs> Marla, some oh. of us never grow up. That's okay. the reality. Right. I just wrote an, a column in my Courageous Aging blogs 
And I wrote a column called Manning Up mm -hmm. in 2017. What does it mean to man up? How many guys are still following the old code of be a man that has us, you know, has the trophy wife or girlfriend or fiance hanging on our arm and we are passing over some of the most wonderful people who would enrich our lives in, in unspeakable ways because we're still looking for that image because we have a problem. Yeah. We have an insecurity. We have a need for appearance rather than reality. Okay. We're still hooked on the way things look and don't balance that with the way things truly are. How many men fall in love with the beautiful woman only to find out to be disillusioned, to feel betrayed, mm -hmm. to feel disappointed, to w be waiting for them to be the person on the inside that they've wanted to have as a companion their whole life. And they're disillusioned and disappointed all over again. So it's time for us to man up right. in the real way as a real human being and to stop seeing women as physical objects, we can enjoy and appreciate, and, and a beautiful woman is a beautiful woman, that, and that's a great thing. But why would we ever miss out on the beauty in any human being, woman or man, that's inside the beautiful, magnificent ways they've grown their own souls, the experience they've gained, the wisdom they have, the affection they show, the love they're capable of giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. Why do we pass up on that? Oh, wow. Well, you are the perfect man so far. What I see of you here, <laughs> let's clone you, and I would love that. So it, it's not only the men, it's the women, and this is very heartbreaking to me, where the women feel this pressure, and then they start getting the plastic surgery and the pumped up lips and all, all everything blown up, and then the men tell me, oh, I don't like that look. I hate those puffed out lips and I don't like the surgery and then it's what are they going to do it's too late and they're still trying to land the billionaire who looks like George Clooney but they're now 45 or 50 and they're dating the hostess at the restaurant you know so it also backfires and and I and and oh. it's just so nice to see a woman kind of embracing you know going along and okay the years are passing but I'm just embracing keeping myself as healthy and fresh as I can but natural yeah, some of some of the feedback that I'm getting because I'm starting to get emails and letters and uh, people who've read the Courageous Aging book, and some of the feedback I'm getting is I love Chapter Ten uh -huh. because it really gave me a way to think about what I'm considering doing, okay, and how far I'm going to go in doing it. Um, you know, I I I I had a woman tell me last week. She said I had such judgment against anybody who would get Botox, mm -hmm. anybody who would go through surgery. And yet, I'm looking, you know, it's that kind of <laughs> looking at myself in the mirror. She said, I got on the elevator mm -hmm. with this young woman at work, yeah. and she was absolutely stunning, beautiful. And I'm sitting there looking at myself in the reflection and going, uh, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should rethink this. Yeah. And so she's considering. Mm -hmm. But she said she, in reading over, how do I value myself and under what terms and conditions, would it be healthy yes. and right for me to get some work? Mm -hmm. And under what conditions, would it be the absolute wrong thing to do at the wrong time? And she said, it was very helpful to me. You helped me think through what I want to do, and now I know what I want to do. Well, and, and a lot of the work the women do, it doesn't make them look younger. It just makes them look, they're still like a 60-year-old with all this work. It, that's all. It doesn't look any younger. So People turning 30 or 40, are going through the same kinds of issues. It's like, oh my God, I'm turning 30 next year. Uh -huh. And yeah. they're going through the same insecurities. Right. Are, it's all relative, will, right? It's all relative. Yeah. Yeah. They will yeah. resurface, it's all relative. Yeah. They'll resurface when you turn 30, 40, 50, 60, unless you start taking inventory and saying, all right, how am I doing with this thing? What? How am I thinking about this in a way that could tie up energy and waste energy and waste worry and get me depressed and feeling despair and dreading the future and being terrified of getting older. How am I doing going about this? And could I rethink that? Could I 
change my attitudes even slightly mm -hmm. and reframe my future, my best possible future, reimagine my best years ever in a different way so I don't tie up all this energy, time, and worry and stress thinking about and worrying about the fact that I'm changing, that I'm going through transitions. You know, I'm going through different seasons of life. So chapter 12, you say, pack your bags and then go have fun. Psycho-spiritual estate planning. What is psycho-spiritual estate planning? Well, psycho-spiritual estate planning is the side. In estate planning, you know, we want to leave a legacy of love. Mm -hmm. We don't want to leave clutter and a mess yeah. behind. And none of us gets to play God and to say, well, here's how long I have. Here's, here's my timeline. We don't get to say that. So for me, taking out insurance is not only life insurance. It's saying, let me put my house in order. Mm -hmm. And part of doing that is not only getting your estate plan or buying life insurance if you need it or putting your health in order or putting your finances in order so that nobody else inherits a mess. Yeah. It's getting your heart in order. It's putting your relationships in order. It's, you know, sometimes we hold on to grudges. Mm -hmm. We don't forgive people. We don't apologize to people that we've hurt. We have this backlog of stuff, of garbage, that we carry around through the seasons of our lives. Well, at some point, it's time to let go of that. It's time to lighten our load, to unclutter our houses yeah. and our closets yeah in our garages and attics or basements. It's time to lighten up and it's time to go live forward without all that stuff. So when I talk about psychological estate planning, I talk about what are the things I need to do to feel better, to, to resolve conflicts, to put my house in order so that nobody inherits a mess and so that I only leave a legacy of love and caring to the people that I will leave behind. No matter, and I could live for another hundred years, but I want to make sure that I put things in order today. That's beautiful, and and I notice as I get older, I don't want anything else. I'm decluttering, and uh, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. And my friends are so get more gifts. I tell people, don't buy me. Stuff I know there. it's like, oh my God, no, I can't use it another thing. So it's like candles or a massage or you know, some food or a mani-pedi, something like that, because there's no more room. And my husband says, we have no more room. And we're not even collectors or anything, but it's like we have a small house. And then all my friends say, yeah, I don't want any more stuff. I'm getting rid of things. And it feels so good. It feels so light. And then you save your money. And then you can say, what kind of experience can I do? Which trip can I take? Maybe I'll go get a massage or pamper myself or go learn, take a class. That's what I love to do now, because when we're younger, it was more about acquiring. That was our status, our looks and what we had, right? It's taking, calling time out, unplugging from our electronics, and taking time to nurture our souls. And that's what, that's what it means when we say, look, put your house in order and then go have fun. Yeah. Go find the things that are going to make your heart sing, mm -hmm. whether it's music, concerts, playing an instrument, right. reading a book, things that you delight in visiting a museum, taking a trip, being with people that friends that you really haven't spent time with, but who you cherish. You know, these are the things that and bring even, joy. And even if we're still working, you know, we might have a lot of us have to keep working till, you know, for years. Maybe Absolutely. a lot of I have friends who are in debt or they didn't save or whatever. And they're like, well, I'll have to just always work. But at the same time, they can do that and then still uh, like you said, not like even when I'm sometimes I'm in my office and then my dog is always with me and oh I got to do this I now I got to write my blog now and I said wait a minute just because I'll feel guilty if I'm sitting there with her just for and I said just sit with her for ten minutes and just connect and and don't yeah and then go back and do it because it's like yeah. I don't if I write dog, one more blog post that's not going to change anything right our dogs are our teachers in that regard oh, you know they'll yeah. they're looking at us saying. Uh, excuse me, when do you take time for yourself? Yes. You know, self-care 101. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we need that to download that new operating system in self-care that right. says, I take time to fill my cup. I, I do things to replenish my energy. I get the rest that I need. I unplug 
and take breaks to walk the dog or go for a hike, the, the nurturing side of life. And that allows me to unplug, empty my mind, focus on one thing, and I feel rejuvenated after mm -hmm. doing it. Some people say, why do you do that? Yeah. Isn't that a pain to go out? No, you know, that's, that's my meditation. That's your meditation. <laughs> it, and you know, you, you know what I love about being older, too, is you really don't have to work, care about things anymore. Like, I come up here to Seattle every month or two, and my mom lives in a 55-plus community, gated, you know, a, a community. And so, uh, but a lot of the people are 75, 85, 90, you know, the older. And so I, every Saturday, they have a coffee. What I love is they're all just who they are. They're not worried about what they're wearing, what their hair, if they look good. That's just all, like out the window. It's just like the books they're reading, the trip they took, or their grandkids, or their, some bring their dog, and it's so much fun just to, it's connecting with these people. And without any of that, that you know, Absolute. outer surface stuff. One of the ways that we, one of the, the prizes of aging courageously is emotional freedom. Mm -hmm. and yeah. We're describing is the freedom from people's approval how, much, how many of us have lived incessantly in, in to, for people's approval, for attention? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, at some point, we outgrow that need. We're free. We're comfortable in our own skin. We realize that what's really important is connection, is not impressing people. Yeah. And that emotional freedom is so liberating. It's so liberating. It's so liberating. We lighten our hearts and it leaves room for connection, mm -hmm. for genuine, authentic, close connection, real conversations about real things. My mom would sit at the table at, at her retirement community, and she had a rule when she first moved there. It was very unpopular because she'd sit at the table. You're eating with these people three meals a day. Yeah. So you like, live with them. And she said, at some point, she said, enough. Uh -huh. I've had it. All you guys do is sit around and complain about what's bad and what's wrong. Oh. She says, from now on, we all get to complain about one thing, mm -hmm. voking a no whining rule. Mm -hmm. One thing and your quote is up. Then we have to talk about things that we're happy about, excited about, curious about, interested in, get to know each other, and do all the other things that are life-affirming, yeah. that are giving, rather than doing things that deplete us drain us and keep us at a distance disconnected from one another well what my mom does so she lives in a community but everybody has their own house it's not like a you know ah. it's 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 a just a the neighborhood you have to be it's a yeah. manufactured home community but they have um meals at the clubhouse love parties and they're having a pancake breakfast on saturday for, but then people she's very popular and people will always sit with her and stuff but everybody talks about their um you know their knee replacement or their hip surgery or their bypass or their diabetes i mean con it's cons everybody's got um here I'm up in Washington State. They're not as health oriented, maybe as LA or you know California. So everybody's got some ailment, but they always want to talk about it. Talk about their surgery. These gory details at the table, at the dinner table. And my mom's like, no talking about sickness or surgeries at the table. Let's talk about other things. And she keeps having to do it, you know. So she, one woman used to like to show pictures of her surgery. You know, <laughs> it's like, all right, well. It takes great courage for us to face into the fact. But this is just the way of life, and we're a part of it. It's much bigger than us, and that we need to go with it and remember the blessings of what this life is and has been. Well, yeah, and and uh, you know we can live. If you're in your 50s, somebody can live another 40 years, and so what? And you're not, you don't have that youthful look anymore. So you're gonna have 40 years of looking old or older. So you might as well, you know, love it or think, you know, make take a funky style, maybe you're that older lady who wears, you know, tights with witches on them or, or a purple hat or, right? Like, do something funky and fun and create yourself and, and you know. Go my have fun. My dad used to say, he used to look at people like older people and say, when did they start dressing like that? Like, you know, all of a sudden, like, when did they start wearing these old people clothes? Like, when did that happen? You know, it was so funny. Like, yeah, so it's all yeah, relative, people. It's it's all relative. We're just living. We're just living. Yeah, we are. And 
uh, I encourage people, you know, the key to longevity is audacity, irreverence, mm-hmm. finding out what makes our hearts sing and doing that. We don't get to play God. We don't get to determine, in most cases, how long we're going to be here, what our time is going to be. But we can live well. Yeah. We can live well. And if we run away from all this other stuff, then we squander the opportunity to become the better, stronger, more courageous version of ourselves. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. And everybody, it's the book is Courageous Aging. That's what I'm doing. So, yeah. all right. All the links are below. Let us know in the comments how you feel about it. Did you notice a shift? Are you aging courageously? Are you cringing? Um, I want to hear your comments. And if you have some comments and questions, we can always do a follow-up with uh, Dr. Ken Druck here and talk about it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Stay well. Bye-bye.